with you guys about photography. Um, what I'm going to start with is the cameras. So if we could have the OPT one up, please, Barry. Okay, so your main players in bird photography really are your bridge camera, your DSLR, and your mirrorless cameras. All of these will be absolutely fine for static birds, so perched birds. Where you might struggle with birds in flight will be your bridge camera. And that's simply because of the, the way it focuses. And it's some, so something called contrast detect, you know, so it, it takes a lot longer for it to achieve focus than mirrorless and DSLR. So if you're looking for your first camera, I think, and if you know, you've obviously already got an interest in birds, for your first camera, I think you really need to be absolutely sure that you're not going to want to go after birds in flight if you go for a bridge camera. And why I say to be really sure is because the better you get, you know, when you start nailing birds perched, there's every chance you'll want to go, you know, you're going to want to step up and get those birds in flight. That's not to say you can't do it at all with bridge cameras. So if you imagine you've got a bird come across in front of you, if that bird is staying the same distance from you or similar distance as it's going across, then a bridge camera will have time to lock focus. But that doesn't happen that often. You know, they rather come straight at you or an angle. And if they're coming straight at you, even with a DSLR, because they're changing the distance so rapidly, even a DSLR can struggle keeping up, um, keeping the bird in focus. So it's not to say that you can't um, use a bridge camera at all, but I think if you go for a bridge camera, you need to be pretty certain you're not at some point going to want to go after birds in flight. Um, mirrorless, I mean, they've come on leaps and bounds. They're, they're fairly new, but I think all the money is going into mirrorless. And some of the shots I've seen from mirrorless cameras when it comes to tracking, keeping that bird in focus, are pretty incredible. So um, with bridge camera, you've got a fixed lens. But with the mirrorless and DSLR, you're looking at adding lenses. So there's extra cost. Um, because birds are usually a fair distance away, you are looking at putting a pretty, pretty hefty lens on that camera. Uh, if we could go to the next one, please, Barry. So this is a, a typical sort of size size lens that um, you'd need to strap to a, a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. They're not light. I mean, you, you can get lighter ones and you can get very heavy ones. Um, so you've really got to think about the weight of these, these lenses, uh, whether you can handhold or not. You know, I, I can't say that, um, yeah, these longer lenses, you, you'll be fine. It depends how strong you are. It depends how long you have to keep it trained on a bird. Because if, if you pick up a lens, and yeah, that's not too bad. Well, hold it there for a minute and then see how heavy it gets. You know, so what I would suggest is if you're interested in, interested in using a mirrorless or a DSLR, and a larger lens, see if a friend of yours has got one that you can just feel the weight of it. Um, but that's hand holding. Can we go to the next one, please, Barry? So what you've got here is you've got ways of supporting these, these cameras and, and lenses. If you're gonna use a long lens, always attach the lens to the monopod, tripod, Etc. Don't attach the camera body because the weight of those lenses, if you just got to support on the camera, the weight of that lens, it could pull away from the mount. 
it costs you a fortune. So always support the lens. So at the top, we've got monopod. You've probably all seen them or got one yourself. On the down from there, sorry, you've got tripod. And the top right, you've got a gimbal that you would put on a tripod or a monopod. The idea of the gimbal is uh, it gives you pretty free flowing um, all, all axes are covered. So it's pretty maneuverable, is, is the idea with the gimbals. Then you've got bean bag. So bean bags, you could use them on your car windowsill, you know, or on a hide on the ground, fence post, that sort of thing. If you're thinking of getting a bean bag, bear in mind there's every chance they're going to come empty. So you've got to think about the polystyrene beans to go in it as well. Now, bottom one is, is a bit out there, this one, and I'm the only person I know that uses this bottom one this way, but bear with me. It might look weird. In fact, a friend of mine calls it a Wally stick. But what it is, if you see um, the red thing at the bottom there, that's actually a, um, a thing that fishermen use on a boat that they put the butt of the fishing rod in to help with the leverage and the weight. But if you combine that with a monopod, that belt is taking all the weight of that lens. Similar to a monopod that's touching the ground, but if it's going into the belt, when you move your body, it goes with you. You're not having to step round it like a tripod or a monopod. You're sort of having to step round uh, the tripod and monopod if it's touching the ground. But with this, the belt is taken all the way. I have to use it sometimes, so I don't particularly like using it. But I've got tennis elbow, and especially at the peregrines, when they can look like they're about to take off and they're stretching and they settle down again, you find you're on there for ages. And then when your arm gives out, that's when they go. But with this setup, I could be trained on them all day. Because I'm not taking any weight, I'm just balancing the unit, if you like. Okay, so it's um, like I say, I've not seen anyone else use it like this. But for if you've already got a monopod, then you're looking at what between five and ten pounds for one of those belts. Probably won't get a bright red one though. But I've got a black one here. But it's it's worth thinking about, especially if you don't care what you look like. I imagine I look like a bit of a wally, but it gets the job done. That's all I care about. I stopped caring what I looked like years ago. So, so you know, for five, ten pounds on eBay it's probably worth a, a go. If you're struggling with the weight, and especially if, you're, if you've got a um, heavy lens and it's just getting too much, and if you're considering getting rid of it, you know, going to something else, then that could be expensive. You know, getting rid of kit and getting half the money back that you spent, when for a five, 10 pound gamble, maybe you could just keep the kit you got and you just use it in a different way. So yeah, it's a little bit weird that one, but yeah, try it. We go to the next one, please, Barry. So let's get into it now. So that's the just a bit of camera gear. There's plenty of gear out there, um, but they're the, the the basic basic parts really. So I want to move on to actually controlling the camera. Now, I imagine a lot of you. Even if you've, um, you're pretty new to this, you'd have seen the exposure triangle. It's just called the exposure triangle because there's three elements to it. So if we start with the shutter speed, the right hand side, all these three things, sorry, all these three things are about allowing light or stopping light hit the sensor. So every exposure for ambient light, and what I mean by that is any continuous light that isn't flash. It's all about um, every exposure being a combination of three things. So you've got your shutter speed. We use shutter speed to um, freeze action or to allow movement. At the bottom, 
we got um, the aperture, which is a physical hole in your lens that lets light hit the sensor. You've got your ISO, which not technically, but you think of the ISO as a sensitivity of your sensor. It's actually gain, you're increasing the signal to it, but there's no harm in thinking of it as you're increasing the sensitivity of your sensor. Okay, so let's go to the aperture down the bottom there. Sorry, I, oh, I was flicking through images here, Barry. Sorry, Chris, my fault. Let me just give me a second, maybe a second. That's, that's all right. Use a problem. <laughs> hmm. Sorry, Chris, for a second. Apologies. No problem at all. That's yeah. it. Lovely, thank you. <clears throat> so, with the aperture, well, sorry, let's, let's take a step back. Every exposure is an amount of light, aperture, being recorded to an adjustable sensor, ISO, for a length of time. That's the, I guess you call it, that's the physics behind it. That's how every exposure is made. It's an amount of light being recorded to an adjustable sensor for a length of time. Now go back to the aperture. You've got apertures there on the left-hand side, like 2.8. On the other end, you've got um, F22. Don't worry too much about the F side of things for now. Anyway, but let's actually let's take F4 and F8. <clears throat> it depends, I'm going to try to explain it two ways, but it depends how you view these numbers. You could look at F4 and F8 and think that 8 is a bigger number than F4. And a lot of beginners will, um, actually, I, I, I do try to explain it to people both, both ways, because a lot of beginners will think, that four is a smaller number than eight. But the trouble is, well not the trouble, but the, the thing is they're um, fractions. So if you put one in front of the, the, the slash four and then one in front of the slash eight, you then have got a quarter and an eighth. So actually F4 is technically a bigger number. It doesn't really matter. Sorry, F4 is a bigger number than F8. It doesn't really matter how you view, view these, as long as you know what going that way with the dial was going to do and what going that way with the dial is going to do. Okay, so I, I, th I think beginners usually look at these as like four is, is smaller, but it's up to you how you, you look at that. Now, aperture, as well as giving us an amount of light, we use it as one part of controlling something called your depth of field. So cameras can only focus at one distance, your focal plane, basically. But what we can do is we can use different apertures to increase that focal plane. It's called depth of field, or you can think of it as depth of focus, or depth of focal plane, whatever makes sense to you. And on that note, if you're jotting down notes along with this, then put it in your own speak because you're the one's got to read it later. Okay, so make it make sense for you later. And on that note, this is being recorded. I'm gonna be throwing a lot of information at you because I'm gonna try and be useful. There's a balance between throwing too much at you but there is a certain amount you may need to know because I mean, we've got 78 people all at different stages. So I am gonna take everyone right back to the start because if you've got, if you can't predict exactly how your, cap, your uh, images are gonna come out, then there's an issue with this nuts and bolts side of things, the, 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 the basics if you like. You know, I've had people come to me that have got letters after their name in photography that don't know the basics because it is something 
you can either be misled about by YouTube videos, and believe me, there are a lot of YouTube videos that will mislead you. They'll use um, what I call lazy phrasing. They'll lead you to believe something that isn't quite, quite right. Uh, I'll be touching on middle grade, absolutely, mid-tone. I'll be all over that in a bit. Sorry, Stella, a <laughs> question come up. So let's get back to this. Every exposure is the amount of light for a length of time being recorded to a sensor. The uh, aperture, as well as letting light in, is one part of controlling the depth of focus, the depth of that focal plane. So your, your focal plane really is from your subject towards your camera and away from the camera, and the subject is in the middle there. So for different um, things, we want um, a different, a bigger or deeper, sorry, depth of field. You know, if you've got a deer, taking a shot of a deer, I know it's about birds, but if you take a shot of a deer and you want the head in focus and the back end in focus, well, you might not have enough depth of field. You need to adjust your aperture until you can get the whole um, deer in focus. But aperture is only one part of it. You've also got your subject distance and the focal length you're using. So let's say we're at F8 and we're going to stay at F8. But what's going to move is the, let's say we've got a bird perched. What's going to move is we are going to physically walk towards that bird. And we're at F8 still, so I'm not going to change that for this scenario. As you walk closer to the bird, your depth of field, we're staying at F8, your depth of field will reduce. So let's go back where we were. And now what we're going to do is we're going to zoom closer to that bird. The closer you zoom to the bird, your depth of field is going to reduce. So things that affect your depth of field, the depth of your focal plane, are your aperture, your the subject distance, how far away the um, subject is, and the focal length you're using. Okay, so shutter speed, let's go back to shutter speed now. There are times you're gonna want uh, faster shutter speeds to, to freeze wing movement. There are times when you're gonna want to allow movement. Maybe you want to allow some wing movement. You don't always have to um, freeze the wings. The upshot is you, you get what you want to get. If, if you want a shot that you know, you're going to freeze the, the body of the bird, but allow the wing movement, cracking shot, lovely. At the end of the day, as long as you get what you set out to get, it's absolutely fine. There's no, no rules with this. Sometimes I'll freeze the wings. Sometimes I'll let them move. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's go over to ISO now. ISO, I think you should be thinking of ISO as a sacrificial lamb or a facilitator because your aperture having the correct depth of field and your shutter speed, certainly in my view, is way more important than the ISO. The downside of the ISO is when you raise the ISO, and you probably, what's well, got written there, you, um, you get more grain noise, they call it, um, but grain in the image. You also lose contrast, you also lose saturation, and you lose overall sharpness, really. But a grainy image, certainly the way I feel about it, a grainy image is better than a shutter speed that isn't right, or an aperture for your depth of field that isn't right. Okay, I um, think that covers that. Can we go on to exposure modes, please? The next one, marvelous. Now on your cameras, you're gonna have um, ways of, of, of taking a shot. At the bottom, you got auto. Oof. No. Just, just don't do it. I'm not trying to be a snob about this, but there's no control in auto, in full auto 
there's no control. Overexposure, you can't control. Um, your focus modes, you just got no control. The next one up from that is program, program auto. Um, unpredictable in my view, because you can never absolutely guarantee what is going to change when the light changes or if you apply exposure compensation, which we'll go on to shortly. The three main ones will be shutter priority and aperture priority and full manual. Don't freak out about full manual, it's a doddle. And there are, I would say, that full manual is actually easier than aperture priority and shutter priority. And I will explain, explain why. So in shutter priority, we directly, and I'm gonna use the word directly purposely, in shutter priority, we directly put the shutter speed in we want to use. We directly put in the ISO we want, we want to use. Some video on YouTube will actually say that the camera just the ISO, it, it, it doesn't. So we put the shutter speed in we want, we put the um, ISO in that we want to use, and the camera gives us the aperture. In that mode, that mode, sorry, to balance out the exposure. But on top of that, we also put the exposure we want into the camera by way of exposure compensation. I'm going to touch a lot more on that in a bit. But the general thing about shutter priority is uh, we directly control the shutter, we directly control the uh, ISO, the camera gives us the aperture but we're not stuck with that aperture at all. A lot of people think in this mode, the camera's giving me that aperture, I've got to use it. You really don't, I'll, and I'll go on to that in a bit. Aperture priority, we choose the, we directly, sorry, we directly put in the aperture we want to use, we directly put in the ISO we want to use, we directly put in the exposure we want, and the camera then gives us the shutter speed. And this is all about the exposure meter in a way for the reason that the camera gives us the shutter speed in aperture priority, the aperture in shutter priority. The best way to think about um, your exposure meter in your camera is like a calculator in reverse. Bear with me. An exposure meter is an an exposure calculator. You think about a normal calculator, you put, say, three numbers in, it gives you the total, it gives you the answer. But with an exposure meter, we put in the shutter priority, sorry, put in the shutter speed, we put in the ISO, we put in the um, exposure, which is the equivalent of the answer, but then the, the exposure meter gives us that float, that missing element. It gives us that variable to get to that answer. So if you consider the exposure, the answer, the exposure meter gives us that missing element to get to that answer. I hope that kind of making sense. In aperture priority, it gives us that shutter speed that gives us that answer. That exposure that we've told the camera to give us, it gives us that, that variable that will end up with that answer. Okay. Let's go into the next one, please. Meter and modes, OPT5. Okay, now, if you've um, looked at any YouTube videos on exposure and manual mode, actually, but I'll move on to that. If you've looked at any videos and even in some books about exposure, you might have been misled because of the lazy phrasing again that they use. Now, this is all about mid-tone. This is all about a default exposure that your camera gives you. And if you've got your phone with you, or a bridge camera, or a mirrorless, what I'd like you to do, either now or if you watch the recording, 
is get your phone, turn the camera app on and point it up to a light bulb. Sorry, Bo, can they actually see me at all? Could you come back to me? That'd be great if you could. You want, sorry, Chris, what do you want? You want? Uh, uh, could you show me, please? Well, I can try. Uh, Is that even doable? Let's, let's, yep, a second, let's try this. Splendid, yes, all see me? Go on, yeah, yeah. go ahead, Chris. Yeah, okay, so all cameras, all digital cameras, sorry, whether it's a webcam or whether it's a five grand, 5,000 pound um, DSLR. In these modes, what I call semi-automatic modes, so your P, your aperture priority or shutter priority, all they can do, because they're a machine and nothing else, all they can do is give you a standard exposure, generally known as mid-tone. If you see anything written up about 18% gray, it's it meaning the same thing. It, that can get really complicated, why they come up with 18% gray. But it's a starting point for that machine you're, you're holding with a lens on it. <laughs> it's so that you have a starting point. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, I'm gonna put something black in front of the, um, the lens on the webcam now. And I'm gonna move it away. See so the exposure at the bottom, it's lighter. Take it away, it's gone dark. That is a mid-tone average. That is a mid-tone average. And if I put something white, you might see a huge difference here. If I put something white, look at the exposure underneath the, the paper there, it's gone darker, now it's lighter, now it's a bit darker. All cameras can do is give a standard exposure by default. So if you've, uh, a classic example would be, if you've taken a shot of a bird up in the sky, say a nice light blue sky, and if you haven't spoken to your camera, if you haven't controlled your camera, chances are you've got an underexposed scene. And that is all to do with this um, default standard mid-tone exposure, because it is just a machine. On these videos and in, um, in some of the books, they'll use phrases like, <clears throat> your camera will give you what it thinks is a correct exposure. There's two things there you've got to watch out for. When they say a camera thinks, the camera can't think. It can compute, and that's very different to thinking. And when they say a correct exposure, that absolutely does not mean an appropriate exposure. It doesn't mean you're going to get what you're seeing at all. Technically, a correct exposure in photography or a proper exposure just means an exposure where the highlights shouldn't be blown out and the, the dark areas shouldn't be pitch black. But all it does to achieve that, or try and achieve it, if you like, is it gives you a mid exposure, not light, not dark, a mid exposure. Could you go back to that image, please, Barry? I can't think which one it was. OPT5, if you got it. Marvellous. So this is why I've written there, where it says correct exposure, that's not me that's written that, because I just grabbed it off the net. But what I have put is, but is it appropriate? This goes back to why I say that auto, it has no use. It has no use because all it can do is expose at a mid-tone average for the whole frame and you can't adjust the exposure. Like I did say, I think, that you can't adjust the exposure. So you could take one shot, the exposure could be off. All you can do is take another shot where the exposure is going to be off too. So there's, there's absolutely no point using auto at all. So what we have to do, if it's, it's our job to look at the scene and weigh the scene up, weigh the tones up in, in the frame and tell the camera if a mid-tone average exposure is appropriate or not. 
So if you're looking at a backlit scene and you don't talk to your camera, you're getting silhouettes. You're getting that, what was a bright sky and all the rest of it in the frame, it's gonna come down to a mid-tone. So let's say you're gonna take a photo of a white cat on a white rug. Well, if you just put your camera and take a shot, you're gonna get a gray cat on a gray rug. If you're gonna take a photo of a black dog on a black rug, and you just take a photo and don't communicate with your camera, you're getting a gray dog on a gray rug. So the first thing I do with clients when they come to me, or I'll send them something to print off. On the wall here, I've got a black sheet of paper, I've got a gray sheet of paper, I've got a white sheet of paper, and I get them to, to fill a frame, to zoom into it, and take a photo of each. And I tell them to look at the images, and they've got gray, 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 because that is all your camera can do. Don't apply any human, um, not human traits, but don't apply what a human can do to a machine. The, the machine, the camera, can in no way judge how an exposure should be. All of that is our job. So when they say your camera will give you what it thinks is a correct exposure, this is where they can lead some people astray because, you know, you could be taking a photo and think, well, that's not correct because you're thinking correct means what you're seeing. And it doesn't. It just means a mid-tone exposure. So that's why, like I say, chances are you've taken birds, um, shots of birds in the sky, a light sky, and you've got a pretty grey sky. Now, the, the grey, if you like, isn't the colour grey. It's an exposure level, if you like. So from white through to black, you've got grey on the way. So that's tones. That's why I say mid-tone. It's not really anything to do with colour. It's just a light level. OK, so every time... When we're in um, semi-automatic modes, P, um, sh shutter speed, or um, shutter priority, or aperture priority, Canon's is going to be TV for shutter priority, AB for aperture priority. Every time we are in those modes, we've got to think to ourselves, as we're holding the camera up, is a mid-tone exposure appropriate or not? What does it look like? What does the scene look like? If it's lighter than mid-tone, so if you've got a lot of light areas, then you'll be needing to add something called exposure compensation. Can we go on to the next image, please, Barry? No. Um, exposure Compensation, you should have a plus, a picture of a plus. Yeah, that's the fella, lovely. Now, exposure compensation, it's called compensate compensation because what we're actually doing is we're compensating for what the camera's gonna do all on its own. Because the minute you, put, you pick your camera up to a scene and you haven't um, used any exposure compensation, you'll get in mid-tone. Whether you remember it or not, your camera's not going to forget to do it. It's going to do it absolutely every time. So, if the scene, so let's say we're um, filling the frame with this white dog on a white rug. If we want a white dog, we've got to add exposure compensation. We've got to tell the camera that I know what you're going to do by default, Mr. Camera, but this scene is lighter than a grey, a mid-tone average. If we want, um, let's go to the black dog, I think it was on a black rug. If we don't want a grey dog, grey rug, then we've got to use negative exposure compensation. So we're telling the camera, or we're thinking, I know what you're going to do, Mr. Camera, you're going to do that grey thing again, aren't you? Well, no, it's, it's darker than grey. So in a real world um, scenario, let's try and get it back to birds if we can. This bird that's in the sky, in a nice light blue sky, you'll need to add exposure compensation. You'll need to tell your camera, this um, sky is lighter than grey. There's no shortcut with this. 
it might sound like a pain that you've got to tell the camera on every exposure how light or dark the scene is. That's just the way it goes. That's what you've got to do. If you don't want um, just a mid-tone exposure of anything, so it doesn't matter what you point the camera at. If you've got um, mid-tone, so you've not got any exposure compensation, whatever you point your camera at, it will be a mid-tone exposure. It won't be correct or it won't be that um, won't be appropriate, sorry. There are times when it could be appropriate. You know, if you're stood in a field, um, field of grass, grass is usually a good mid-tone, by the way, um, and you've got some trees at the end of this field and they're also a similar tone, then yeah, um, not dialing in exposure compensation will give you a realistic exposure, but only because the tones in that frame, you know, equate to a mid-tone exposure. Even auto will get that right because that's what auto does. That's the only thing auto does. So if you give it the right scene, then yeah, okay, auto could work. Uh, Sorry, I just read the question there. I'll try and get to that one. So yeah, it's all about we have to communicate. We have first off, we have to know for a fact that the camera can't judge what an exposure should be. If you allow a small part of your mind to think that your camera could possibly do that, you'll be expecting some help from your camera that you're never going to get. And if you, again, if you allow yourself to, to believe that, I don't think you'll ever fully get your head around um, control and exposure. You have to have that as fact in your mind that you've got to tell it everything. You've got to treat it like a baby. You've got to do everything for it. It can only do this one thing. Like I say, sometimes that will be appropriate. Most of the time it won't be. Not if you want an accurate exposure. A lot of people are quite, a lot of people really are quite happy with uh, there or thereabouts sort of exposure. Don't settle for that. Try and try and get a proper exposure. Um, can we go on to the next one, please? Yeah. Okay, so this one. When I was um, having a chat with Keith about what you guys might want to see and all the rest of it, he did say, well, if you could show some um, some exposures that are overexposed or underexposed. Trouble is, um, the idea is not to get those in the first place. So I had to reverse engineer this shot, <clears throat> and this is a peregrine in the shade. This middle part, the middle shot here, this is what would happen if you just took a shot, if you didn't talk to the camera. I don't know if we can zoom in, zoom in on these images or not, but the middle one there is um, what you would get if you just picked up the camera and took a shot. And what I've had to do to find out what, you know, reverse engineer, what I've had to do is um, get all the pixels in that middle image and um, blur them, do an average blur in Photoshop to get this gray at the bottom. So this gray at the bottom, that's your mid-tone. And if you've ever seen a, um, a gray card that, you, that they can use for exposure, setting the exposure, that's the sort of gray you're looking at. <clears throat> but this top um, image, if you, were to, if you were to pick your camera up and have this bird in the frame and then think about exposure, <clears throat> you would have to use negative exposure compensation, otherwise you'll get the middle one. That's what I'm actually trying to get at really here, it is you've got to talk to the camera. You look at the tones in this frame and they equate to an exposure that's darker than a mid exposure. And the middle one equates to a mid exposure and it's horrible. Okay. Um, so let's have a bit of a chat about about um, metering. What have we got? Two, just two seconds. Sorry, can we go to OPT6, please, Barry? I think I've skipped. Not you, I think it's me that's done it. It should be metering modes. Sorry, I'm being a pain, I know. 
OPT six. It should be. It should be like your your red boxes and, and that sort of thing. That's a fella. Lovely. Thank you. That's it's me. Gonna I've gone out of order here. I've got, Okay, so when I say um, the average of the whole frame, what I'm referring to is um, is this evaluative metering. All metering modes are on your camera are different areas your camera looks at to make its calculation. So you've got evaluative metering, which looks at the whole frame. Spot metering looks at a little bit. The, the center part, partial, bigger than the spot, what, what they do is they ignore all the others. So spot is just looking at that small area, ignoring the rest of the frame when it makes its calculations for exposure. And you've got partial and you've got center weighted. Now, I very rarely use evaluative metering because when you use evaluative metering, you've got to look at the whole scene and work out what the average is going to be. So you've got to allow for light sky, you've got to allow for shadow area. It can be quite tricky. And as far as I'm concerned, really, evaluative metering is a very ballpark way of metering. Nine times out of 10, I'm in spot metering. Now, you can get any exposure you want as long as you can estimate the tonal value of someone. Now, what that really means is the meter in our camera is something called reflective metering. And the long and short of it really is, it means we have to tell the camera how something appears, how light or dark something appears. If we're to do it in the narrative, we've got to tell the camera how um, the scene appears in an average uh, exposure. But with spot metering, I find it so much easier to use spot metering because it's only a small area. I could meter from someone's jacket. I could meter from a fence post. I could meter from a dog. I could meter from literally anywhere. If I can estimate, and if you can estimate correctly how light or dark that area you're metering from is, you can get the exposure you want. Okay, so. That uh, peregrine that we saw a minute ago, I wouldn't have actually even metered from that scene. My exposure would have been set half an hour before I even saw that bird. Because what I do is I will find something that's getting hit with light, hit with the sun. I will look at it, I will judge how light or dark it is I would put that into my exposure compensation. So let's say I'm metering from a white sign in a car park. So I'll look at that white and I'll say something like, I think that white is one stop lighter than midtone. Now, I just said one stop. Okay. A stop or a step. You can think of it as a step. There's no problem with that. One stop lighter than midtone is two times lighter than midtone, so twice the exposure. Two stops lighter than midtone is four times lighter than midtone. Okay, so one stop is two times lighter. Four, two stops is four times lighter because it's every stop is two times. So you've got one stop is two, two times lighter than midtone. That's two stops is four times lighter because it's two times the two lighter than midtone. Three stops equates to eight times lighter than midtone because it's two times two times two. Hope that makes sense. What I would suggest is that you take a shot of um, a white sheet of paper. You'll get a midtone exposure. If you, if, you know, this could be with your, your phone or anything in a semi-automatic mode. Just take a shot and your default exposure is going to be mid-tone, okay? Then um, put your exposure compensation, knock it up a notch, which should, on most cameras, it's, they're divided up into thirds of stops. 
So take it up a notch, take another shot, up a notch, take another shot. And you'll get an idea of what one stop light in the midtone looks like. One stop light in the midtone is actually white sheet of paper. That's one stop light in the midtone. Okay, and it's only because when I've been years ago, when I was learning all this, there's not a square inch of my back garden I haven't metered for. And what I mean by metered for, I mean, I've looked at an area, I've tried to estimate how light or dark it is, I've told the camera, and I've taken a shot. If the exposure looks right, I was right. Okay, but you can meter from literally anywhere. And going back to that um, peregrine shot, and like I say, I wouldn't have even um, waited for that peregrine to even be home before I set the exposure. I would have found something as soon as I got out of the car. I would have found something that I could estimate how light or dark it is. I put my um, exposure compensation in, however much it needs. And then I would be up onto that area and I would lock the exposure. Can we go to um, exposure lock, please? Which, marvelous, that's it. Yeah, if we go back one, sorry, go back to the, the button if we could. There you go. Hang on. <laughs> yep. Uh, forward two, I think. Marvellous. Thank you. Exposure lock is um, really underused. It really is because if I've uh, I've metered from somewhere, I've told the camera how light or dark it is. Okay. And I've locked the exposure. See, when you, when you have an unlocked exposure, the tones in the frame matter. So if um, you've got a bird and you're following the bird, and say, and say at that point it's exposed properly, and let's say you've put in plus one stop because you first saw it in the sky, you put plus one stop exposure comp compensation in, you're getting the shots, exposure's lovely. You follow that bird now down and it goes in front of some conifer trees that are pretty dark. Well, those images are going to be overexposed because you've actually told the camera these conifer trees are one stop lighter than midtone, when in fact they'll be maybe a stop darker than midtone. This is where a supposed lock comes in because you can lock the exposure, and as long as the amount of sun hitting the bird stays the same, then it doesn't matter whether your bird's in the sky or down in front of trees or wherever, because you've met, what you're doing with, when you're metering is you're measuring the light. So you can think of metering as measuring the light. You're telling the camera, in this light, this area, let's go back to the, the white sign. In this light, this white sign is one stop lighter than midtown. That's all you're doing with metering. You're measuring. You're telling the camera that hasn't got a clue how light or dark anything should be. You're telling the camera this area is this exposure value. And if you lock the exposure, then it doesn't matter what background is behind the, um, the bird. Your exposure on the bird will be the same as long as your light is the same still. Can we go on to the next image? I think it's two ducks, I think. Uh, this one's fine. Yeah, whichever, really. If you look at this one, then, let's, let's stick with this one for a minute. You see, it's, it's only a slight difference, really, with the sky behind these shots. This was just a, a, a burst of shots with the exposure locked. With the background being slightly different in each, if I didn't lock the exposure, the exposure on the bird would be different from one to the other. But the fact that I locked the exposure, I mean, I could have locked it on, you know, I could have meter from a brick wall or a post or anything to get this exposure. But the fact I locked the exposure means that the background simply doesn't matter because the light hitting the bird is the same. It's just the background is different from shot to shot. So a lot of people say, you know, say that, that you know, when they follow the bird, that they don't lock the exposure because 
Well, I don't know why, to be honest. I don't know why that they, they do it, because the background will make a difference. As you can see here, could we go back to the, the one? Last uh, one, lovely, thank you. Here's a classic. Well, not a classic, it could be more obvious. But I've locked the exposure from shot to shot here. And let's say I lock the exposure off on that log that the birds have sat on. If the light stays the same, it doesn't matter if a dove turns up. It doesn't matter blackbird turns up. And then there you've got two ends of the spectrum, really, a light bird and a dark bird. If the exposure was unlocked, these two exposures here would be very different from bird to bird because the, the tone of the bird would make a difference. But the fact that you lock the exposure doesn't make a difference. If the light stays the same, you know how the exposure is going to be. It's not going to change on you, no matter what bird turns up. If the light changes, let's say the clouds come over, okay, you've got to unlock the exposure and then relock again because the light's gone down on everything. Everything's now darker. But if you're metering from the log, and let's say that we're metering from a part of that log that's um, mid-tone, let's stick with mid-tone for that. If the light changes, the light changes on everything, but that log is still mid-tone. So it's simply a case of unlocking and then relocking exposure on that log at mid-tone. And then whatever birds turn up, we're gonna have it exposed properly. It's worth spending time learning this metering malarkey. It really is because if you know for a fact, how something will be exposed. And there are people that think you have to take test shots to find that out, you absolutely don't. Even with a DSLR, you don't. You, you need to understand the metering. But what I'm trying to get at is, if you know exactly how something's gonna be exposed, no guesswork, that completely frees you up. It's in your pocket, box ticked, done. It completely frees you up for waiting for the right moment. Or um, let's say, let's take it away from birds just for a second that you, you're taking portraits. You know, it leaves you to um, wait for the uh, perfect smile or whatever. You know, you haven't got to worry about it. It's, it's in your pocket. It's, you know what's going to happen. Okay, so I'm not a fan of test shots, especially if we get it back to birds now. Oh, well, Okay, you might have to use test shots while you're learning this stuff, but try and get yourself in a position where you don't have to use test shots because, especially with bird photography, sometimes you get one shot. Okay, so you can't, you simply, there are a lot of times when you just can't do the test shot thing. Don't expect to um, get it overnight. It, it won't happen. You know, if, if, if you're new to photography, however old you are, You've spent no, that many years not having to think like this, not having to think about a default exposure of a camera. Okay, but if you invest some time in learning this and getting yourself in a position where you know full well what the exposure is going to be, no guesswork whatsoever, that just frees you up. You know, rather than having to worry about the exposure, a lot of people say that oh, I go a bit heavy on exposure and, oh, come on, mate, you know, it, it's supposed to be fun. I don't see any fun in going after something and not getting it. The real fun is nailing these shots. It really is. So a bit of investment in learning this metering malarkey. Then this fun starts. Then you start nailing shots left, right and centre. Yes, you can adjust exposure to a point in the likes of Photoshop and all the rest of it. But the less you do to an image, the better. I wouldn't expect to have to adjust exposure when I got home into Photoshop and all the rest of it. I really wouldn't. Um, but yeah, you can make some adjustments in exposure, in, sorry, in, in Photoshop, but try and make that your aim. Don't expect it, like I said, don't expect it to happen overnight. You absolutely won't, especially if you're, you're new at the game. <clears throat> but key is, this exposure thing is about 
keeping it solid in your mind that your camera can in no way judge how an exposure should be. It can do this standard thing you, you correct from. You're correcting from this mid-tone 80% uh, gray standard exposure. If it's anything other than um, a mid-tone exposure, you've got to tell your camera. Okay. Um, quick chat about manual mode. That time's cracking on. Quick chat about manual mode and why it's so handy. A lot of people say you've got more control in manual mode. You, you haven't, really. I'm amazed how fast this time's gone. After another one. Um, in manual mode, so if you fit your cameras into manual mode, you'll see an exposure meter come up at the bottom. Okay. Why um, that exposure meter is so good, or so handy, if you like, in, in manual mode, is because that exposure meter is telling you how something will be exposed with the current settings. So if you are in spot metering, so a small area, and let's say you're pointing at a dove, and you look at the exposure meter while you're pointing at the dove, and you see the exposure meter is one stop darker than mid-tone, well, you know, well, you will by then, you know that a, a dove is lighter than mid-tone for a start, maybe about a stop lighter. So you know that that dove is going to be underexposed. If that's underexposed, everything's underexposed. So what you do in that scenario is you move your aperture, ISO, or shutter speed, depending on what you can move. You move it until the meter is in the right place. So let's say that the dove is one stop lighter than mid-tone. You move those settings until the, the meter, the, the indicator on the meter, is in the right place. But, well, not but. Another thing that happens is when you move your camera around, you'll see the indicator on the um, exposure meter. You'll see it move. You'll see it when you go to a darker area, you'll see the exposure meter come down. It's telling you how dark that area will be exposed. You move to another area of a different tone, the exposure meter will move again. It's telling you not what it might be exposed at, what, not what it could be exposed at, what it will be exposed at with these current settings. So a combination of manual mode and spot metering means you can check every square inch of a scene and how everything will be exposed before you take the shot. So that's really where you don't need your test shots. If you are concentrating, especially in, in manual mode, because you get that meter, you don't in the other modes. But if you look at that exposure meter, and once you get an idea of what mid-tone looks like, what one-stop lighter looks like, you'll be able to tell how everything in that shot will be exposed in this light with these settings. Okay, so I'm sure some people think that you know the needle races up and down, it's like some sort of game or something. It's screaming at you. It is screaming at you saying, this is gonna be exposed at this, value, this exposure value with these settings. You know, and when you're pointing at, let's say, you guess, let's go to a pigeon, and let's say, point at a pigeon, and your exposure meter is plus one. It's gonna to be too light. Okay, because you look at it, it's, it's a mid-tone, it's mid-gray, mid, not color gray, a mid-tone. So you move that until it's in the middle. And then, then if you're thinking, oh, I don't know, is it mid-tone? I don't know. Let's have a look over there. Move your camera over with that area. The meter's telling me that's going to be exposed at this value. Is that right? Well, yeah, that looks all right. So maybe that pigeon is okay. Let's check somewhere else. You can check over the whole frame and know how the exposure will be. That was interesting. Um, so can I suggest we just we get through the uh, last few technical ones, and then I think yeah. we can uh, we can hopefully look forward to a, a part two when we can go through some of those great photographs and 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 yeah, and I'm, I'm amazed can. how fast it's, it's gone. <laughs> it's absolutely well, it's such gone. a big topic to cover. So I'm not surprised in some ways. It's it's, it's so yeah. much so much detail. It's, 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 it's great. Yeah, it's difficult. It's, great. Given, it's difficult giving too little and not enough. Absolutely to... right. Absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah. So just yeah, so. Let's go, yeah, let's crack on, let's crack on through. Um, focus modes, I think it's probably back one from here. Mm. 
No. Yep. Okay, on the left hand side, you've got Nikon, and right hand side, you've got Canon. If your bird is perched, you can use AFS on Nikon, that's like a single focus. Um, but for, and on, uh, sorry, on Canon, the one shot, that's like a single focus. So you can half press, you can move your camera over, push it the rest of the way, the, the shutter release, and that will stay in focus. If you're after birds in flight, then you want a continuous focus. So your lens is continually focusing on that, on that bird as it changes distance. So that's AFC in uh, Nikon and AI Servo in Canon. Okay, next one. <laughs> Lovely. Um, what you've got here is, is your drive, oh, it says it, it says it up there, drive mode. On the left-hand side there, you've got like a single shot. So you hit the button once, you get a single frame. If your camera only does symbols, like some of them do, you're, you're um, looking for a continuous shot, so, so you're getting plenty of frames. Look for a symbol where you can see it's like pictures, frames on top of each other. And that means you're like a continuous shooting mode. Okay, so we get to some questions quick. You've gone quiet. He's muted. Yeah, by all means, Chris. Um, I think yeah. we're, uh, I'm just cognizant of the of the time. Um, we uh, there's there's a few that have come through tonight. I know we've got quite a few that were posted beforehand. I'm just wondering whether the best way might be to try and uh, to respond to individuals because some of them are quite technical. Um, yeah. If that's and do you, want to, do you want to scroll through these images while I'm doing them, maybe? Get yeah, both sure. done at the same time. Yeah? yeah go okay, on. first question is from Sheila. Do you have to invest in expensive kit? No. Sorry, quick answer. But my lens that I use for all these shots you're going to see, secondhand, £400, I pay for that. I'd have no problem strapping that to a £300 camera, and I wouldn't be expecting much less quality at all. Secondhand market is probably favourite for that. No, you don't have to spend a fortune at all. Uh, Hilary, I'm going to let you down. Tips on using telescopes with mobile phones. I don't do that. I really wouldn't know. I wouldn't want to guess and mislead you by just guessing an answer. I wouldn't know. Sorry on that one. Uh, technique on using a bridge camera. Again, it's the same for any camera, really. It's your shutter speed, your, um, your aperture, your ISO. I think I didn't really go through it in much details I want. This hour is just gone. Um, birds in flight, best settings. Well, for if you want, the first thing you want to do is answer your own. If you want to flick through these images as I'm going, just flick through them. Um, birds in flight, um, you got to um, decide whether you want to freeze. Um, no, I don't, I, I don't recommend back, oh, back button focus, that depends. I don't use it. I don't see a need for it. I'm a left eye shooter. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't suit me. It might suit some. I can see the logic in it. Yeah, so best settings, it depends if you want to freeze wings or you want to um, let them blur like this, this blue tip here. Uh, faster shutter speed for freezing them. Um, as for aperture, it depends how far away they are. Remember, we went for the depth of field. The further they are away, the greater the depth of field you're naturally going to get. So a wider open aperture would be fine for that. Um, we went we went through exposure on metering that sort of thing uh, my bridge camera shakes sorry this is jeff bridge camera shakes like 600 mil what would help um stabilizing the camera somehow either using the image stabilizer in the camera uh tripods um that wally stick method of mine using a faster shutter speed to counteract any shake there's a few there how to improve practice really um it's knowing, knowing the physics behind it all and then applying logic. That's the approach I take. Um, so we've been through the whole amount of light for a length of time being recorded to a sensor. After that, it's, it really is practice. What's the next step up? Sorry, this is Joy. What next step up from a bridge camera on a modest budget? Will a DSLR be too heavy? Modest, modest budget, um, second-hand market, DSLR with a long... Uh, lens could be too heavy, depends how strong you are, possibly. Try and get your hands on one and find out. So I'll suggest for that one. Uh, Patricia, I'm only using the basic functions on a bridge camera. How can I increase my ability over time? Ah, this is a tricky one. And can I recommend courses? Can't recommend courses. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be a pain about this. 
but everything that I've seen, um, you, you know, I was going on about the midtone thing and I really laid it on about the, the standard exposure. The lady came to me, she did a 10 week course of a local college. Not once in that 10 weeks I'd even mention the midtone standard exposure. Um, I know a, a school child as well, where the teacher told them that the shutter speed was the length of time the aperture, aperture was open. So even in schools, they're not being taught right. I haven't come across a uh, course I would recommend. Uh, can a telephoto lens be used in the insect photography? If you put um, uh, extension tubes on, you could. Ideally, you want a, a macro lens. But extension tubes are a cheap way into close-up photography. So have a look into to them. Oh, aperture ISO, sorry, this is John. Aperture ISO and speed for short and long range perched birds. Again, with your aperture, if it's in a fair distance, then um, a wide open aperture is still gonna give you a fair amount of depth of field because it's so far away. Um, ISO has to be what it has to be to give you the speed and the aperture you want to use. As for the speed, it depends on the bird. If you're looking at a small bird that's flicking around, you need a faster shutter speed. If you've got a buzzard sat there that's just glancing around, you don't need the shutter speed anywhere near as fast. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the questions I've got. That's them. I'm sorry. Chris, yeah, sorry. It's such a, such a big topic to cover. I think uh, what I would suggest is, as you said at the outset, is that... Uh, People will actually re replay this one tonight and, and work their way through the, the various parts of tonight's talk, take it in turns. And I think we, we may well be looking for a, for a part two. Um, I'll be happy to come back and do it, absolutely. Great. I mean, thing is, I saw, when I do a course, it's, well, it's six weeks or two hours each, each time. I said, there is a lot. Um, but I hope that's given you a, a yeah. taste. Even seeing the images, I hope it's given you a taste of if you do spend the time nailing this exposure thing at least, then absolutely anyone can do this. You don't have to be intelligent. I mean, yeah, I, I, I walked out of school without sitting a single exam, and I mean even the, the smaller exams where you just put pencil in there. So I didn't even do them. And if I could do it, you can absolutely do it. Chris, really. fantastic. Uh, if one thing I can certainly own up to, I've been a, a classic auto setter. So um, from tonight onwards, I shall remove that that from <laughs> personally so I can, I'll, I'll do a self confession tonight. So uh, yeah, you've certainly inspired me to take, take that, uh, no longer use that function. So thank you for tonight, Chris. Okay, thank you no everyone problem. who stayed on. Um, as I said, we're, it is recorded and get posted overnight. And I know there's probably some more questions. So we'll, if, if there are more questions you have not managed to get them answered, can I suggest you post them through to Nicola? Um, Chris, I know you've offered to uh, respond to any that we come through. So um, yeah, Absolutely. Chris, post any questions through to Nicola. We'll get them through to Chris and then get them responded. Can and, I just throw, just throw uh, one really quick? Please do, Chris. Facebook for Oakwood Photography Tuition. I've got videos on there. Knock yourself out. I can't cover most things in videos. Have a look and see how you get on. Chris, fantastic. Thanks very much for tonight, Chris. Really, really Brandon. appreciate it. Done a great job. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks for everyone uh, for attending tonight. Uh, great to uh, see you all again tonight. And uh, please look out for the next uh, next talks. We've got a continual range of talks coming up over the following weeks. One or two we've posted, but we've got uh, more that we'll be posting in the coming weeks. Chris, thanks again. Marvellous. Good night to everyone. Take care. Bye, Bye. Bye.